The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Hi, welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Well, today we're spending the day at Blue Fruit Farm. We've got a treat for you. We're gonna be checking out some wonderful berries and some really unusual ones with Jim and Joyce. They are the owners of the farm. We'll also be talking with Jim about what it means to be organic. Stay tuned for Garden Connections. Well, Jim, thanks so much for inviting us to come out to your place here. You have a beautiful spot on top of a gorgeous hill. It's really gorgeous out here. Well, thanks. It's my pleasure. Thanks for coming. Now, folks may not know it, but you are an organic expert. You have been on the National Organic Standards Board. I mean, you're the go-to guy here in Minnesota for all things organic. And I thought perhaps we could start by having you help folks understand exactly what organic is. You know, it's a word that's used a lot, not always used well. Uh -huh. uh, and you're the expert. Tell well, us, <laughs> tell yeah. us what organic is. Yeah, I've been in it a long time. Yeah. I don't know if that makes me an expert, but I've certainly, uh, I was an organic organic inspector for 20 years and helped start the Organic Inspectors Association. So I've visited a lot of organic farms throughout the country and been involved, like you say, in the National Organic Standards. And since 2002, there's actually a federal definition of what organic means. And just in simplified terms, it's crops that are grown in harmony with natural systems. So uh, the land has no prohibited materials, so no synthetic fertilizers, no uh, synthetic pesticides, no genetically engineered crops are allowed. You mentioned in, a, in kind of a natural system, the word natural is used a lot in marketing yeah. campaigns. What's the difference between natural and organic? Well, it's a big difference because natural really has no legal definition. So companies use it just to as a marketing claim, whereas organic is defined in law and there's actually, it's a federal crime to wow. fraudulently label products organic okay. if they're not organic. And there have been people prosecuted for violation of the law since it took effect. But also, I didn't mention the land has to be free of those prohibited materials for three years okay. before a crop can qualify to be called organic. And there's, you know, organic and certified organic. Okay, and what's the yeah, difference there? Yeah, and under the federal law, um, there was an allowance for small farmers to still use the word organic without having to be certified. So someone selling at a farmer's market or, you know, roadside stand, if they're using the same practices that are defined in the law as organic, but they sell less than $5,000 a year of organic products, they don't have to be certified. Certified. So they can still claim that something's okay. organic, but if they're challenged, they would need to be able to, to, be prove, able to that. prove it. So the rules right. of production are the same right. either right. way. Right. It's just certification is actually an inspection process. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you had to fill out quite an extensive paperwork called an organic plan, an organic system plan, and then that's reviewed. And an inspector comes to the farm or comes to the processing facility, goes through everything about it. You know, the fertility management the weeds, the insects, the borders, the records, right. how you sell your products, all of that, and then files a report and then, uh, then you can receive certification. Now, are those certificates public record or is that something that you can ask, say you're at a farmer's market and you want to know for sure yeah. that a, a producer is certified organic? Is that something you can ask for? Is that available online? Well, yeah, both. Um, if someone is certified, um, that is public record and there's the National Organic Program website, which I'm not going to repeat, <laughs> but if a person just does a search for National Organic Program, they can find it. And there is a list of all certified operations available available uh, on that website. So that's one place to look. But when you talk about, you know, asking questions at a farmer's market, that's always a good idea. You know, right. not just are you certified organic, but how do you grow your crops? 
because a lot of people use organic methods and don't even claim you know they're organic or some people claim they're organic and don't know what they're talking about <laughs> right because so there just, is a lot of confusion yeah. out there as to what exactly that means right but right. it sounds like there are some very specific rules for yeah. the producers they uh -huh. have to follow certain protocols manage their land and then subsequently their plants right. and pests and so on if you are a consumer what does a certified organic or an organic that follows the rules what does that yeah. mean for you as a consumer well um, I mean, people buying organic products, uh, you know, now that we have the federal rules, uh, uh, they've, consumers and retailers have really responded. There's been a tremendous growth in the demand for organic products. And some of the things, I mean, you're not getting the pesticide residues, which is a huge concern, or some of the other things I mentioned that aren't allowed. And it's really the only label where if people want to avoid genetically engineered crops so or foods, GMOs, right? GMOs yeah. Yeah, so that organic is a category where those are not allowed. So that's another big important thing for consumers. But some of the other things that research is finding that consistently organic products not only have lower or no pesticide residues, but you know the trend is showing higher levels of various nutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and some of the you know other health promoting uh, aspects of food. But you know when you're growing things in healthy soil, they also have higher flavor profiles. So oh, okay. levels of bioflavonoids are consistently higher. Interesting information. Well, organic certainly is something that a lot of people are talking about. And you have clearly chosen to operate your blue fruit farm under those principles. And I think we should go next to meet one of the people that inspired this current operation. Okay. Shall we? Sounds good. All right. All right, thanks. She is. You got her working hard today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Joyce. How are you? Hi, so nice good to, to see you. you. Thanks for letting us come out today. Yeah, well, welcome to Blue Fruit Farm. I understand the inspiration was yours. Tell yeah, us a little bit how yeah. you got this idea. <laughs> well, Jim and I used to farm vegetables organically uh, back in the 1980s, and we helped get the farmers market started in Winona. So. Uh, when we had quit farming for a period of years because of some other organic work that we were doing mm -hmm. and, um, and then another organic farmer was renting this area uh, and you can see uh, we have a big fence around there and then to keep um, out the deer, to keep out, to the, keep deer, out the deer which yeah. is essential in this area. So um, when he decided to consolidate his uh, operation down by Rushford, Minnesota, um, this became available and we thought, well, what, what can we do, what with, can we do with, with, it? with it? Because it's already got a nice, wonderful deer fence around it. So right. I thought blueberries because <laughs> my mother grows blueberries down in Georgia and she says if you're on an island with no, just one food, blueberries is the thing to grow. <laughs> so You grow a ton of blueberries, but grow. you also grow many other berries and some of them a little bit unusual that folks may not have heard about. Right. Tell we, us about your other berries. We kind of decided, well, we grow aronia, um, black currants, elderberries, June berries, jasta berries, honey berries, and we grow blue plums. Anything in the blue, black kind of color scheme of fruits. Is there um, a reason for that? Well, partly because they are very, very high in antioxidants. They're very, very healthy for you. And that's one thing is I want to really grow healthy food for people. Um, and also we are looking to grow perennials, things you didn't have to plant year after okay. year. With climate change. <laughs> right, yeah, weather extremes. But you have to have patience. It takes quite a while before blueberries, especially, start producing a crop. Right. Um, so yeah. But we had other criteria. We had it needed to be a shrub, uh, needed to have no thorns. Yeah, okay, so yours. take out all the raspberries, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> black raspberries and things. And then uh -huh. we wanted it to be about this high so that Jim is kind of tall and he doesn't like to bend down too much. Yeah. So. Nobody does. It's hard to right. back right. after a while. So yeah. the blueberries, these are all northern high bush uh, four foot plants when they're full grown. When so they'll be grown. a little be up here. Okay, well let's take a look at this one that we have right here in front of us. This is a blueberry plant and these are all, you said, northern high bush? Yep. Um, okay. This is a variety called Polaris and it does have pretty big berries you can see here and you can tell a ripe blueberry when it doesn't have any kind of uh, 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 red on it like oh, this I one see. does. Sure. You can yep. see 
yep. the difference. So when we pick uh, blueberries, we want to be sure that we're picking really, really ripe berries because that's the sweetest berry as well as the you know highest vitamin C mm -hmm. and, and other. If you, because it comes off the vine pretty easily, if you accidentally pull one that has a little bit of red in it, will it mature? I mean, will it ripen like it, some fruits it do? It can ripen a little bit more uh, in, you know, if it's not refrigerated too much. If, it, if you have a whole bunch and you just want to let them sit on your counter, then it will ripen. But it but will never be as quite as sweet and right. good flavored. I, as I the never get that full flavor. <laughs> Any soil prep, I understand blueberries yeah. are a little bit different in terms of the, the pH, right? Right, yeah, blueberries want an acidic soil. So in the range of a five uh, pH. Okay. And our soils here naturally are like 6.8 to seven, so very neutral. Okay. So we had to do quite a bit of amending the soil. And what by, did you put in there? Yeah, uh, quite a bit of compost, which will help lower the pH, okay. but then also worked in a lot of peat moss. Um, all, and then have mulched with uh, pine straw, pine needles, um, which also are acidic, but then adding elemental sulfur, um, which is allowed in organic. So we add that to our compost, and so then um, each year we're putting more compost around the plants. What about water conditions? I've seen yeah. blueberries actually planted on kind of like little hills. Right. Is that important? Do they not like wet feet or no. are they really pretty tolerant? They they like constant moisture, but they can't be in saturated conditions. So they don't like wet feet, but yet you don't want to let them dry out. So last year was very challenging. We've got drip irrigation to all the plants, but it wasn't enough to make them look like this last year. It was just enough to keep them alive, really. A lot of the fruit kind of dried up. Um, but they were younger and that was fine. So it's just nice to see they made it through last year yeah. and they really yeah. liked all the moisture we had this, spring. had this spring. But I've still been irrigating too. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would say in order to, if you're a commercial grower, irrigation is absolutely essential to get blueberries because they do they take yeah. a lot yeah. of water uh -huh. in order to fill out the fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not sure. getting right. at least an yes. inch of rain a week kind of yeah. thing. Um, These are looking great, Joyce. How many blueberries like in pounds do you get for, for a homeowner that wants to put a few in a garden that would like to have some fresh blueberries, how many plants should they consider about? How many pounds are you going to get off of this well, plant? Well, uh, varieties differ, but anywhere from 10 or about 10 pounds per plant when they're full grown. Um, yeah, which would it, be some varieties are five, five pounds, some varieties are 15 pounds. So you, you will look for that when you look at the catalog description. Okay. But another important thing is to have several varieties. Even for a backyard gardener, you want to have at least three varieties. You'll get better pollination, better fruit size, um, with a few varieties. We have 14 different varieties here. Wow. <laughs> that was That's one good. thing we were reading about. We thought, let's just put in a lot of different varieties. So that was right. another criteria was the berry size as well as you know being a, a northern high bush. You want northern high bush, not southern high bush. Okay. So that's another factor another to look for. Consideration. Yep. All right. Well, when we come back, I'm going to ask you about how you take care of these in your organic system when it comes to pest management and weed management, which are constant challengers for any gardener. Yeah. But in the meantime, we're going to have a visit with Chef Steven Larson and he's going to be making a great recipe using some blueberries. I'm Chef Steven Larson. Welcome to my kitchen at Quarter Quarter Restaurant in Harmony, Minnesota. Next recipe we're going to do is blueberries. Well, it uses blueberries anyway. The dish that we're going to put it on is called panna cotta, uh, which just means cooked cream in Italian. Panna is cream, cotta is cooked. Uh, but it's a cream-based gelatin dessert. Uh, but the first thing that we need to do is make some blueberry sauce for that. So we have some beautiful fresh blueberries uh, here in the container and we're going to make a simple syrup. Now a simple syrup is exactly that, very simple. It's equal parts sugar uh, by measure, so a half cup sugar, half a cup of water, very simple, right? Put it on the burner, we'll bring that to a boil, then to that we're going to add the blueberries, we're going to bring that back to a boil. Now the other part that we're going to uh, do here is some fresh mint. So we're going to add that to the blueberry sauce. It's going to go very, very well with the little bit of Sambuca liqueur that we're putting into the panna cotta. Uh, so we need a rather good shot of fresh mint here. 
and I'm going to be using a total of two tablespoons uh, finely shredded mint. So we'll just kind of stack those up and we'll give that a very fine shred, what we call chiffonade. So now that that's come to a boil, we're going to add the blueberries to it. And let that come back just to another boil and that's plenty enough to cook the blueberries and start getting the juices coming out of them. All right, so now that that's come back to the boil, we're going to add our mint. And we'll stir that in. And just take it off the heat. Now we want to serve this chilled and the panna cotta is a cold dessert. So I've made one of these already and had it thoroughly chilled. You want to let it uh, go in the refrigerator about four hours or overnight is even terrific. So that's how the finished sauce will look. The next thing we need to do is make the panna cotta itself. So for that, I have half a cup of milk that I'm going to sprinkle over a teaspoon and a half of unflavored gelatin. Now we do this to let the gelatin bloom, so to speak. It's basically rehydrate. And this, then we just need to bring up just to the scald or just a bare simmer, and that will also then uh, melt the gelatin. To that, we're going to add a few tablespoons of sugar, uh, a little pinch of salt, about an eighth of a teaspoon, and a tablespoon of Sambuca. Now Sambuca is an Italian uh, black licorice or anise flavored liqueur uh, that gives a wonderful flavor to this dessert. And we're going to finish that up by pouring it into ramekins. Now these are uh, ceramic dishes that we use in the restaurant all the time. You could use custard cups, uh, you could even use wine glasses if you wanted to. Uh, but traditionally, uh, panna cotta is served unmolded, meaning we run a knife around the outside, which I'll show you how to do, and uh, turn it out of the container that it's served in. Uh, if you're going to do it in wine glasses, you can just leave it in the wine glass and put the sauce on top. It's a lot easier on you. Right, so now that our gelatin is done, we need to add that to the cream. So I've got my cup and a half of cream here, heavy cream, um, chilled in an ice bath. We're gonna add the sugar and the salt to the gelatin mixture. and stir that until it dissolves. Then we are going to stir that all into the heavy cream. Along with that tablespoon of Sambuca. And then we need to stir this gently over the water bath or ice water bath until it has the consistency of like a pancake batter, you know, uh, just sort of uh, thickened so that you can see that it's really setting up. And that will keep it from separating in the ramekin. That's why we do this step. If we just poured it right in the ramekins and refrigerated it, it would tend to want to separate. So now that we've got this chilled down a bit, we're going to put it into the ramekins. And we're gonna let those chill. The finished panna cotta, which I have here. So you can see how that's set. It still wobbles a little bit. You don't want this firm like jello jello. Uh, you want it to be soft, but still uh, set. Then to unmold these, take a thin bladed knife 
go all the way around the outside and pop it on the plate. And when we've got that unmolded then we'll take a generous amount of our beautiful blueberries and mint sauce. So there's the dish, Sambuca Panna Cotta with blueberry and mint sauce because there's nothing better than eating fresh from your garden. Thanks, Chef Larson, for another great recipe. Love those blueberries, they're fantastic. Fresh or in, a beautiful dessert. We are here at Blue Fruit Farm, and Jim has walked me over to another section of their farm where they have a different type of berry that they grow, and this one's aronia, right? right? aronia. And or, what do you use these for? Well, um, and the common name for the aronia is the black choke berry. Oh, Not okay. choke cherry, but choke berry. Choke and it's berry. a shrub. Okay. But that gives a little clue that it's astringent, a bit tart, <laughs> kind of like a cranberry. Okay. So, uh, but very healthful. So, four to ten times the antioxidants of blueberries. Wow. Um, An incredibly delicious flavor once you sweeten it up. Okay. So, they make just great juice or jellies or wine and they're very hearty. Now these are clearly at a green stage. What right. color are they going to turn? Well, deep turn, purple or yeah, I see deep you've got purple almost black. Some turning they, a little red now. Yeah, yeah, it'll be about another month and they'll be ripe and they all ripen up at once which, which is nice compared That's handy. to the blueberries. <laughs> Although they, you kind of get one shot at it and then you're done or will they yeah, uh -huh. re Right. Okay. Right. But uh, they and, and and they pop off and they're, they get about the size of a blueberry, so a nice mm -hmm. size, mm -hmm. round and a little harder. They aren't as juicy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't like to eat them just fresh, but I've come to like that. And we had a field day last year and I noticed this boy, probably about eight years old, and he was just stuffing them. He loved <laughs> Hand the over flavor. fist, he so, loved them. So you know, but, possible uh, to eat them fresh, but, yeah. but maybe a little on the tart side. Right, so you can right. use them in cooking and making jams and jellies and wines and and great things. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit earlier about organic practices right. and weeds are a problem for any gardener oh, yeah. as are uh -huh. pests of yeah. a different uh -huh. sort. Uh -huh. right. Tell us what you do here with your berries because I'm sure yeah. we are not the only ones that would love to eat your berries. You probably have other critters well, that would like them right, too. Right, <laughs> right. Well, uh, so first for weeds, um, we do a lot of mowing and we've planted clover as a cover crop to help. Any t weeds always fill a void, so when you sure. don't have something, the weeds are going to come. Right. But if you have clover there, that helps right, right there. Because clover then, is pretty aggressive, is that right? Yes, it's pretty aggressive, but it's a nitrogen fixer. So it's putting that nitrogen into okay. the soil, plus it blooms and provides food for the beneficials, for the pollinators, all oh, kinds of okay. different bees. Sure. Um, so that's one of the benefits. And then uh, we also do quite a bit of mulching mm -hmm. with uh, first the pine straw for the blueberries, but then everything has gotten mulched with the ground up uh, bark, hardwood bark. bark. Okay. And then we do a lot of hand weeding. So we've had crews <laughs> out here, that, right? <laughs> yeah, crews out here uh, pulling weeds. And you know, the problem weeds for us are the quack grass because mm -hmm. it's runners and rhizomes. It right. just keeps coming You can't just up. mow it off and right. keep it in place. And then some of our rows have uh, a 20 year landscape fabric mulch layer oh, okay. underneath the uh, natural mulch on top of that. Okay. And some of them don't. So we have a lot more weed challenges in the ones that don't Where have. Where the landscape fabric is right, not. Did you put that, that down when you put your plants in there? Yeah, we, we would uh, lay it uh, and then cut holes in it and plant into it. it. And then okay. the drip irrigation is on top of that. On and top. then okay. the bark mulch on top of that. Okay. And so that's good. been very successful, and that's another practice that's allowed under the organic standards. Right. Okay. So, pests of yeah. another variety. Well, um, up here on the ridge, our biggest pests would be deer. And yep, so and you've we've got, got this beautiful fence, deer fence. So that's <laughs> that taken care of. And I see it's electrified well, on the outside right, too. Have, is that for the deer? No, that okay. is for the raccoons that would oh, climb up okay. and cross over. So I have a line of electric there, okay. but then I also do some live trapping uh, okay. for raccoons. For raccoons, yep. So, because they can get in and just tear up um, bushes too. Right. 
Um, but then the biggest category of pests that we have are the birds. Are the birds? Yeah, mostly robins, see, yep. but also bluebirds, which we've done. Which you all, love? You know, we <laughs> love, and we used to have bluebird houses that we've taken down now. Cause, okay. You know, I just saw an indigo bunting this morning okay. up here, but the so they're cedar wax but they're wings competing. They, but they, yeah, they love fruit. Right. Um, so we have a sound device that helps scare them away. Okay. We also have some fake owls and yep, peregrine. Yep, I see that. Falcons You've got those sprinkled that throughout help the place. a little bit. Um, but the what thing, about netting? Well, because you see that in catalogs, nursery yeah, catalogs, they say you have to net your fruit. That sounds like a pain. Well, it's it is a lot of work, and we've done individual row netting. Well, we'll have like you know lengths of netting that are mm -hmm. 100 feet long, and put these little hoops over. But then to pick, you've got to pull the staples and get it back out of the way, uh, and make sure it doesn't uh -huh. get caught into the plants. And right. you know it's a, so we have in motion a plan to put about three acres of our total four acres in a net house. So nine oh. foot overhead will be posts and cables supporting netting. And so we'll actually be growing inside a, a net structure. Interesting. So it's a long-term investment. Right. It's not something the backyard gardener would do, but we put a lot of work, a lot of money, investment into, into getting the these. fruit themselves. Right and it's not just a big bird feeder. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Well, I'll be interested to see that when yeah, it's finished. Yeah, you'll come back next year. I'd hope to have it in place for this year, but everything takes more time than oh, you sure. anticipate. And Gardens got, are always that way. Got weeds to pull and <laughs> fruit to harvest. So That's but, right. Well, you uh, have a beautiful place here, and the berries are delicious. We yeah. have loved sampling those. Jim, thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your experience and oh, knowledge with you us. Bet. Thank you. And thank you for watching Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. I look forward to seeing you next time. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook.